putting the crowdsourced in the ultimate crowdsourced personal finance show. Welcome to Choose FI. All right, guys, we are back. Super excited to hop into it this week. Brad and I are, we have more Households of Fi episodes coming, but we are going to take a week off from that and just so that we can kind of address stuff that's going on inside the community. To be honest, we just miss you guys and we want to share more <laughs> conversations, more questions that you're posing to us in the group and by email. And they have been, we've been collecting a backlog and we couldn't delay it anymore. There just wasn't enough time. So we'll be going back to our household series starting next week. But this week, uh, Brad and I are just going to kind of do a wild card Friday. So uh, with that, uh, to help me with this, I have my co-host Brad here with me today. How you doing, buddy? Hey, Jonathan, I am doing quite well. Yeah, it feels good to to be back. It feels like uh, kind of old times here. We're back to basics. I think obviously, put it mildly, the last six months have been kind of crazy in everyone's lives. And, and you know, frankly, with Choose a Fight too, right? We have changed up. We were doing daily shows and then three times a week. And now feels like we're settling back into our into our rhythm, which is cool. And and to your point, this is and always has been and always will be a crowdsourced show. This has never been about me and you. We are just the conduits to get this information to people. And obviously we like talking to each other. It's fun. And, and you know, for whatever reason, people like listening, but but this is about the community. And yeah, I think the more that we can go back to it, and like you said, we've been doing that with the households of Phi. I think that's a really cool new way that we can present the community and what people are experiencing when they first get into the world of financial independence. But there are people obviously in our Facebook group, we have 70,000 people in our Facebook group now, Jonathan, and people are asking incredible questions all the time. People are sending us emails and voicemails and and we want to share these things. So yeah, this is uh, maybe, I don't know, is that is that a little bit rich to say back to basics? I like back to basics. It's good. I like to think about what we try to do is kind of like a, it's, it's hard to, it's, it's actually, now it's a reality, but even, even a couple of years ago, it was always kind of like, I have a feeling we'll cover most of the breadth of, of content within about a three year span. You know, if we're showing up, introducing a new idea once a week, and then getting the audience's feedback on that, allowing them to ask their version of the question to apply that to their life there's probably, you know, there's probably about three years of really unique, big ideas. And then at the end of that three years, the, the, the fact of the matter is the stuff that you talked about three years ago has, it's time for a refresher on that. And also recognizing that the audience has doubled and tripled. And many people don't know what the best way to find that information is. It's time for a refresher for me. You know, so if we covered the Roth conversion ladder two and a half years ago, I'm, I might need a refresher on that. And then, you know what, maybe now tools that I was getting introduced to and seemed over my head two to three years ago. Now I take those for granted. I got it, you know, or, but now I'm in a better place to understand some of the more advanced concepts that maybe the first time around, they just seemed, they just seemed out of reach. Or maybe I was in a different investing. Like you go through this investing cycle when you're started, maybe you're digging your way out of debt. You're not thinking about at that time, the content didn't serve you. But now you're in a more aggressive place. You're ready to really increase that savings rate, take advantage of more advantage. And now you are ready. Like if only we could talk about that again, um, really with my situation in mind. So I think that's the advantage of kind of going to your point, back to the basics. So I wanna, Brad, I realize that someone is listening to this, you know, maybe for the first time and they saw the title back to the basics and they were intrigued and they said, you know what? There's a lot of episodes. There's a long archives. Maybe this is the one that I start with. So you know, I thought maybe we could just spend a few minutes just kind of giving someone an orientation and kind of letting them know what we hope to deliver for them if they invest, you know, maybe a significant amount of their time with this podcast and with this community. And so I thought we could split this up. Let me just share a little bit about our goals for the podcast. And then because I really think about this as a movement, I know we both think about this as a movement and kind of as an ecosystem, a friendly, safe place for people that, you know, reject that idea that money has to be a taboo topic and living a better life has to be a taboo topic. Um, I'd like to kind of share with people kind of what we've tried to build over the last couple of years. So, so first with the podcast, uh, it, it's, we, we have tried a bunch of different cadences, but I think we have landed on a steady state of two episodes a week on Monday and Friday. On Monday, we do one of two things. Uh, it, the focus is always to introduce a new idea or a new story. And that will manifest as either Brad and I tackling a concept and doing a deep dive on it, or bringing on a guest to share with us a new idea or share with us a story that I think needs to be heard by the larger community. 
the goal of this is if you take this quote from Jim Rohn, you're the average of the five people you spend the most time with. If you choose to spend your Mondays with us and with the guests that come on the show, it's going to expand your universe. It's going to expand your body of knowledge. It's going to open up the ideas of what is possible slowly in a very non-intimidating fashion. You're going to be aware that there's just things that you didn't know that you didn't know. And over time, you're going to pick and choose what works for you. But those strategies and those tactics and that information is going to lead to a better life. When we, when we added the Friday roundup onto this, the idea was that this is our hot take and it's our guest hot, hot take, but it's done with our bias and with our lives in mind. And that's not good enough when you're trying to scale to millions, right? There, there are unique obstacles, unique challenges. There are reasons that from your perspective, it might not work or additional questions that you might have. And the conversation is better when we're able to incorporate that feedback into the show. And so we very quickly, to Brad's point, we moved away from a show about Brad and Jonathan to a crowdsource show where it was very intentionally set up to say, what is your reaction to this? What is your question about this? Is this valid? Do you agree? Do you disagree? Why? You know, and we can, we, at, as truth seekers, we can go down these rabbit holes, these thought explorations, and our content is better because of it, because of you, because you're here, because you're participating in this process. So that, that's how it started, but it kind of, Brad, it's flowed out of that to really a larger community and a larger ecosystem. And I'd love for you to, to kind of share with our audience that, you know, that where you see that now and where you see it going in the future. Yeah, Jonathan, it, we very quickly realized that the community is everything, right? The, as we've always said, and as we said earlier, the, this could not be about me and you. It couldn't be, right? It's always going to be a crowdsourced show, which means there are hundreds upon hundreds of thousands of people in the Phi community. And when we can all help each other, it truly is a rising tide lifts all boats scenario where our entire baseline just gets better and, and higher, if you will, because we're sharing this information. So community is, tr is critical. It's truly everything. So where we have many different aspects you can get involved in. Yeah. And the single easiest way to do that is to sign up for our weekly email. So Jonathan, every single Tuesday, I am sitting down and writing an email to our community for our community, right? It's, as I say, it's ideas to ponder, inspire, and motivate you on your own journey to FI. And a lot of this is also crowdsourced. We're talking about people's wins from that week. What was the action they took? And I asked people to hit reply to that email. Jonathan, I get hundreds of them every Tuesday that I go through one by one to read what people are doing to make their lives better. Because again, we can share this. Then I just pass it on the next week. And we talk about what are those wins? What are people doing? When you see other people making their lives better in real time, it inspires you to do the same. So yeah, I would really implore every single person. I write these emails, like I said, personally, every single week. It's one of the most enjoyable parts of my week is just sitting down and what are the things that have made my life better? What can I, what have I taken in, in podcasts or books that I'm reading? Like I'm always trying to make my life a little better. Obviously this is very, very, very much a work in progress. Uh, and by no means have I, have I figured it out, but, but I'm always trying, I'm always looking for that information. So yeah, you can just go to chooseabout.com slash start. And there is an opt-in right there, smack at the top of the page. And that will get you on our list and it will also get you involved in this community. What I'm going to say next, Brad, is going to make your head explode. <laughs> I have in my inbox 6,450 oh, no. unread emails. Oh, 6,450 no. unread emails. I am desperately trying to come up with a system to delete in mass <laughs> and unsubscribe in mass without losing, you know, valuable content that I need to hold on to. And I've gone through inbox zero strategies multiple times and I, and I can't quite get there. I say that all to say that your newsletter is not one that I would unsubscribe from, <laughs> right? It is not one that I would unsubscribe. It's actually the reason that I'm trying to come up with a system to delete carefully as opposed to in mass, because there are certain emails that you can tell people are putting time, heart, and soul into this. And then there's emails that are people are just using swipe copies and sending you mass marketing emails. And it's just a giant ad. Uh, yours does not fall into that category. The point of this is not for Brad to sell you something. 
The point of this is to connect you with this community, to encourage you to take action and to make it easier to find a tribe, a community of like-minded individuals. Uh, the way the email has been framed is it's Brad sharing a, a, a point of pain, a point of growth, a personal challenge that you're working through, an example of how you're taking content that we have produced or shared on the show and taking action on that and how someone might as well. It is a life hack, a small optimization strategy, something that you can do this week. Maybe it's timely to be, to just do one, you know, get 1% better. We talk about this idea of the aggregation of marginal gains. A lot of people make fun of those individuals that pack their food and bring it with them to work. Um, and it seems like such a small thing. What if someone were to tell you, you know, how did you get to financial independence? Well, I packed my lunch and brought it with me to work every day. Such a small thing. But when you realize that maybe that small thing that they do is really just the tip of the iceberg. It's a 1% improvement, a 1% improvement where they figured out these small strategies that basically look like them having more or less an identical life to their peers. But the difference was one to $2 million in their bank accounts at the end of their investing lifetime. You know, that 1% adds up really quick when it's aggregated on other wins. So what if you could get, you know, these strategies in a drip size bite that you say, I want to, I'm going to work through this this week, or maybe that's not for me, but maybe next week something will be. That's what these, these newsletters are points of encouragement, but they're highly vetted, highly curated and highly valuable. And so, you know, I would just say, if you're just, you've, you've listened to the podcast, but you didn't know Brad was doing this, it's worth your time. This email will not be one of the 6,450 mm -hmm. unread emails. We get hundreds of responses to these emails each and every week. We ask for these responses. We want to know what is your big win? What did you take action on? It really drives us forward. It drives the show forward. And so, you know, if you want accountability, if you want wins from the community, if you want Brad's personal insights, then make sure you're part of this list. Just go to choosefi.com slash start. Look for back to the basics and just put in your name and email address right there. We will get you included on this. Now, I said all that to say, that's just kind of like what you can do right now. If you want kind of what we've put together to land in your inbox once a week. What if you want to be more proactive? What if you want to get started? What if as of right now, you're 15 minutes in waiting for us to tell you what is this idea of financial independence? What does that mean? I think one of the biggest things is that financial independence and the idea of financial independence looks different to different people. For me, it means options. It means I get to choose what I do with the best years of my life. Uh, and I guess, Brad, what does it mean to you? Yeah, I mean, financial independence is freedom to me, ultimately. It's the ability to live life on my terms. And for me, that means spending time with my family. And it does not mean having fancy things, right? Like, it, hold on, I want to say that again. It, it means spending time with my family. I, that is something that I have said from the very first, this is critical. This is what I want to do with my life. I want to spend time with my loved ones. I want to spend time as I see fit. I don't want to spend my most precious resource, which is my time in a job that I just doesn't light me up. And that frankly, I really didn't like. So for me, I made the choice and that word is so critical choice, right? That's the beauty of Phi is it is a series of choices. It is not up to us, certainly, myself and Jonathan. It is not up to anyone to dictate to you or tell you even how you should spend your time, your money, your freedom, your resources, any of this stuff. It's your choice. But I made the choice that fancy things, expensive cars, going out to eat fairly often, like those were things that I were willing to give up a little bit, right? And I hate to use the word sacrifice because to me, it, would, it never felt like a sacrifice. I bought a new car in uh, 2003, which sounds crazy at this point, and the car drove perfectly well. And I just never felt the need to trade it in for a new model or get a lease or get a BMW or whatever it may be, right? If that's your thing, if you're a car person, go for it, but make that decision with eyes wide open, right? So for me, the choice was I would rather save that money and be able to get to a point of financial independence earlier and quicker and spend those years seeing my daughters grow up. I mean, to me, for my own life, that's the easiest decision in the world. But again, this comes down to choice. And I think so many of us, very sadly, 
go through our lives with blinders on or just sleepwalking, right? We've been led to believe that success looks like X, right? Success looks like slaving away at, I don't want to use that word, Andrew, cut that. Success means working 60 hours a week to get that next title, right? Success means driving a fancy car and living in a big house, going on fancy vacations. You can still have many, if not all of those things, but you can do it smarter, right? So we have been led to believe that that is the only path to success. And we are here to say, there's another path. There's a path that you choose. You don't have to follow. You don't have to follow those societal expectations. And there are millions, quite literally millions of people who are saving money, not so that they can be called cheap or frugal or misers or any of these other really derogatory words, frankly, but they can save money to accrue power in their lives that give them choices, that give them the ability to have freedom however they see fit. That might mean spending time working a job that you've always dreamed of, but never would have made enough money, right? You can do that. You can volunteer. You can do truly whatever you want. If you want to, sp if you want to spend that time learning new skills, Jonathan, that's a huge thing for you, right? Is learning new skills. You can do that. The world is your oyster, right? It absolutely is. It goes back to that idea of options. You know, I think um, many of us, there's some words that come to mind that when we get into our mid thirties, mid forties, mid fifties, we kind of, we feel frustrated. We feel stuck. We feel uninspired. And we feel like the choices we made when we were 17 or 18, or maybe in our early twenties have kind of dictated the next 40 years of our life. Uh, and that we're kind of glad that at least the, the standard narrative says it's supposed to all work out when we're 65 and then we can enjoy our golden years. At least our golden years are going to be okay. Uh, that data is backed up by some studies that said that, uh, I'm looking at one in particular here. It was a nonprofit group, the mental health of America and the fast foundation. They did a study back in, I believe 2017. And it was a large study with over, I don't believe 17 to 20,000 participants 71%, and they were spread across five industries, 71% of those employees said they were unhappy, that they wanted to change employers. And it, it strikes me that what we get when we get some bandwidth in our lives, when we get some savings, when we have a little bit of margin is we have options. So this isn't even binary. This isn't about getting to the point where working is optional. You're either there or you're not there. It's like you get on this path for a relatively short period of time it makes this little hurdle of being in a job that's just not it's dragging you down. It makes it way easier to jump ship. You know, when you're paycheck to paycheck and you get a new boss and they're toxic, absolutely toxic. You probably just kind of do what you have to do to kind of make it to the next period because I don't know, you can't afford to not get a paycheck. You can't afford to go a period of time without this money. When you, when you have, in my case, we call it FU money, this idea that maybe you could go a year or two years without a paycheck and you'd be fine. It's kind of different than an emergency fund. It's just you having the confidence that you're on the path to financial independence. Um, and you have a lot of time to figure things out if something goes off the rails. When you're there and you get this new toxic boss, you're not just thinking about looking for a new job. You're proactively looking for a new job and you're doing it from a place of strength. You know, you're actually doing salary negotiation. This new job probably comes with a pay raise because you're not moving horizontally, you know, you're moving up and to the right. Um, it's just, it's all about what can we do now to get options or life, recognizing that we're all coming from different places with different obstacles. Some of us are working, we have this great degree, but we also have six figures of student loan debt. We're making a great income, but it's all going out the window. We feel like we've worked so hard. We have such a great income. We should be doing better, but we're just paycheck to paycheck. And we're kind of embarrassed about it. We don't really know where it's going. That individual has a different series set of struggles than someone that is maybe non-degreed, maybe in a service job or making minimum wage. And what does the strategy look like for them? You know, I think if it's just Brad and Jonathan sharing kind of our path, then you're going to be kind of limited to what we have actually done and our own inclinations on tackling this problem. But when you have a community saying the tie that binds us is 
we want more options in our life and we're working from where we are to where we want to be and we're sharing the decisions we made to get there, suddenly you're like, I can get on that ride because that's broad enough. That includes enough personal stories, enough personal challenges. There's someone that's similar to me with a similar set of obstacles in this group that if I lean in, I'll be able to find them and I'll be able to learn from them. You're proactively choosing to change who the average of those five people are. Historically, the average of the five was your zip code, your neighborhood, your high school friends, you know, et cetera, your, your colleagues at work. What if you get to pick? You can say, well, I want to pick mentors that have outperformed in their industry, outperformed in their, in, in their sector, have made some great life choices while working through incredible obstacles, maybe even more difficult than mine. What did they do? And what can I do? What can I do from where I am right now? And so if you then take that and we say, okay, really financial independence is not, it's not, a, not even a number. You know, it's not if I get to this number, then I never have to work again. Really, it's just a, a strategy for optimizing your life and a, a way of reframing the question to not, you know, oh, it wouldn't be possible. I couldn't possibly do that. That's for people who whatever too. And we don't say that, that we don't even entertain that. Instead, we, we say, what would it look like if I could? I wonder if there's other individuals who were able to do this. What did they do? Let me go find them. Oh, wait, there's a community of people that are all about sharing this type of information. Let me start there. Now I would say, yes, challenge accepted. Let's get started. And so, you know, each week we're kind of looking at it from different angles. This isn't a show where every single week we have a doctor on the show sharing how they were able to spend a little bit less and put all that savings toward getting Fine, It's a great story. Doctors need this. A lot of doctors are paycheck to paycheck in their fifties. They're really fighting hedonic adaptation, but it's also the story of the individual that was, you know, making $15 an hour in their early thirties and couldn't see the path out and then realize, oh, with these couple tweaks, they can be on the path to making 80K six months from now. Got that path mapped out. We can talk about that and share that strategy. We can point you towards that content, those individuals. There is something here for you regardless of where you are and whether or not your issue is I need to earn more. Most of us would like to earn more. Whether or not your issue is, well, I'm already making an above median income and I'm in a job I kind of enjoy, uh, but I don't know where my money's going. Okay, we'll solve that. We'll solve that where, where you are. But like over four years, Brad, have we missed anything? I mean, is, is it all there now or do we need to go back and start over? And so you got the, you know, the, the, the person there in their mid thirties, they're making $15 an hour and they don't see the path. And with this small tweak, we've got this, there's a program. You could be trained in a new industry within six months, making 60 to 80 K. This is possible. And for those of you that are interested in this information, we'll actually share the episode with you. It'll be in the show notes for this episode. Uh, and Brad will talk about it a little bit more on the newsletter that's going out next week as well. But we can ha- you can retrain and reskill into an entirely new industry and open up all sorts of opportunities. So I'm just saying, I just want you for right now this week, I don't want you to have the pressure of saying, well, I feel stuck. How can I fix it this week? I just want you to embrace the idea that maybe there, it, it is possible. Maybe you could move forward. Maybe this is the first day of the entire rest of your life and we can get, you're like, all right, I'm willing to take small action. I'm willing to trust the process. I'm willing to focus on this idea that, you know, my, my best days are still in front of me. All that being said, I know there's, there's a lot of vapor there, right? There's a lot of like, okay, that's at a very mega level. Like what about at a micro level? And since we can't cover everybody's scenario all at the same time, Brad, what if today we just kind of tackle maybe a specific case study and we draw from someone in our community. Yeah, Jonathan, we actually had a really interesting post in our Facebook group here by Shane. He said, I'm a recent college graduate, 23 years old. What advice would you give yourself when you were my age regarding investments, retirement slash 401k and paying student loans? I want to invest, but I also have about $30,000 worth of student debt, but I am only making around $41,000 a year. And then he actually goes on with some other interesting stuff. Currently, I'm able to get a 15% discount on LabCorp stock, but I'm not sure that's worth it. All in all, I'm wanting to learn more about investing in the stock market and would appreciate some tips. So yeah, Jonathan, there is a lot to go on there. And I actually included that last bit because I think I think a lot of people do think that this is about getting some kind of some kind of tips sometimes. You know, you hear a lot of like, Oh, what's that special, that special advice that's going to get me there. So, uh, we will definitely dive into that. I think to me though, is it where I would start and where I would start with, with, you know, Shane's 23 year old or, or my 23 year old self is 
is largely about simplicity. I am now 41 years old and in my adult lifetime, I have yet to see something that where complexity, that there's something complex, there's some secret behind the secret that is going to get you to some Shangri-La and, you know, this is the path to success. Pretty much everything I've seen in life that has led me to success and led me to where I am now is just based on true simplicity. I, I don't know about you, Jonathan, but I, I'm, I've yet to see any type of secret. So for me, it just, it comes down to, at the heart of it, it comes down to savings rate and it comes down to time. So for me, and I'm obviously curious to hear what you have to say, Jonathan, but for me, it's just, how can I increase my savings rate? How can I make my life, my structural expenses just simply not cost that much? right? Because again, we talked about freedom and choices. You have so many more options when your life just simply does not cost that much, right? So if you get locked into some expensive mortgage when you're 24 years old, your options are decreased. Obviously you could always sell, et cetera, et cetera. We could talk about that, but, but you're losing flexibility. So for me, and this is what we did with my wife and my wife, Laura and I is we bought at 26 or 27, we did buy a house, but we bought the, basically the least expensive four bedroom house we could find in the area of town that we wanted to be in. And we knew that it was something that we could grow into. We didn't have kids at that point. The house, I kid you not, this four bedroom house in one of the nicest parts of Richmond, Jonathan, I don't think I've ever said this. My mortgage was $1,265, $1,265. I'll never forget that number. And that was with like a fairly significant interest rate. So we actually refinanced and got it down, I think under $1,100. Wow. And yeah, I mean, people's heads all across the country are exploding when they're hearing this, but I had a four bedroom house in a really nice part of town for basically $1,100. But, you know, I, I'm kind of diving into the weeds here, but for me, it was always, how can we get those structural expenses to not cost that much. So it was that, it was our car, which the aforementioned uh, golden boy, as you like to joke, it's my 2003 Civic that I had car payments at you know 0% interest rate on, on that car for five years. And after that, after 2008 hit, I have not had one single car payment for 12 years now. Yeah, so I think someone listening to your story, you know, um, you'd be tempted to think that you know, everyone that has reached financial independence has done so because right out the gate, they were making, you know, this incredible income. You know, this is for people that were able to somehow graduate with no student loan debt, and then were able to make six figures right out the gate. So Brad, did you and or Laura ever make six figures as an accountant? Honestly, never. Nope. Never. Never, not once. And we started off, I think in the $40,000 range, uh, somewhere right around there. And yeah, in my entire working career, I never hit, certainly never hit a base salary of, of a hundred thousand. So now clear, you are dual workers. So just being, you yeah. know, you, you have, it's a dual income family, but at Absolutely. some point, Laura did step back at least in working capacity to be at home with the kids kind of walk us through, if you don't mind, you know, you have two individuals making 40, you're both getting raises. Like what was the most, well, actually no, that what I really want is when you're really doing the, the heavy lifting of what you did to get you to financial independence. Yeah. What was your combined salary between you and Laura? Yeah, Jonathan, I would have to go back and look at our tax returns, but I cannot imagine combined that we ever made more than $120,000 at, at the absolute height. Even at the height, which is probably as you were getting closer to financial independence, right? Yeah, because you know what's interesting is as, as we were approaching FI, that was actually when Laura's job had gotten significantly less because then we had, we had two kids at that point. So when we first moved to Richmond, I had a full-time in-office job. Laura was working from home. This yep. was way back in 2006, working from home virtually. And, you know, she was making her same salary. So that was probably, we were probably right around that 120,000 or thereabouts. And at your peak earning years. Yeah, I, th I think so. You know, it, it, no, no, th this is very fun. What I wanted to point yeah. out to individuals is that if you think about the way your life was set up structurally, 
One of the things that enabled this is that you were not to use the term house poor. Like you are making probably at the, at the, when you both are graduating, you're starting out probably between you and your spouse making around $80,000 a year combined as a, as a dual income family, yeah. your house, your mortgage that you signed up for your house was 1265. If you had refinanced it with current rates, it would have been about a thousand. Now there's a slight little optimization uh, here because where you ended up living and this, this, this wonderful home that you purchased in a nice part of town, uh, this wasn't just the most convenient place to live for you. The most convenient place would have been back with your family and, you know, back in your roots, which is actually Long Island, New York. If you had done the math, well, if you had stayed in Long Island and started and had this kind of similar experience in Long Island, what do you expect your mortgage payment would have been for something comparable in Long Island? Yeah, I think I think it probably would have been roughly double that. I don't have the exact number, but yeah, when we when we were running the numbers back then, I think it was it was easily double. So twenty five hundred to three thousand dollars a month, and that was back back in two thousand five, two thousand six. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, just that one decision, right? And this is not to say, again, there's n nothing that dictates that you have to follow a certain path on your own path to FI. This was a choice that we made. So we made the decision when we got married that we did not want to be house poor, that we wanted to have flexibility someday down the road when we had kids, as I like to joke, our future fictional kids at that point. And Laura might have, Laura believed she wanted to stay home with those future fictional kids. So we set up our lives to give ourselves that flexibility. This was before we had kids, but it was a decision that we knew was important to us. So why would we, in essence, chain ourselves to an expensive mortgage that would require both of us to work, right? Yes. So that's the key. We always knew that if, even if Laura decided to stop working, we would be fine because we had higher than a 50% savings rate. So by definition, we were saving money even on my salary. And that was assuming no raises. That was assuming none of, none of all this other stuff, Jonathan, that we've learned salary negotiation, all these things we've learned through Choose Up High. This information was unavailable to me in 2006, right? You know, so clearly the that, me today- That line and, cracks me up. This information <laughs> was unavailable to me back then. <laughs> <laughs> right? But I mean, think about how much you and I have learned just from listening and being part of Choose a Buy. That's what's so cool about this crowdsourced information, right? Is we all get better. What we take as a given now, when we talk to Chris Hutchins about not just sending in a recipe, not just sending in your resume and just spamming it to hundreds of different companies, but to actually take the time and care. Like, would you ever apply to a company the same way ever again? No, of course not. You would do the Chris Hutchins method. Would you ever apply to a company without salary negotiating? No, of course not, right? Because we listened to Tori Dunlap and Jessica, the financial mechanic, right? We've had both of those episodes. Like these are just baseline information now because we've all gotten better. That's the beautiful part, right? But I knew none of that back then. And we still assumed, okay, even on my piddly little 3% cost of living raises, we're going to be fine. And obviously then you can still adapt. You can start businesses. That's what I did, right? I started a website called richmondsavers.com, which is still hilarious to this day. And that turned into Travel Miles 101, which turned into meeting Jonathan and starting Choose a Five, right? Like you never know where life is going to take you. And that's the beautiful thing. You're picking up skills, you're picking up knowledge, and you're leaving yourself open to not only serendipity, but the ability to jump on things, right? Because you have flexibility, because you're not stuck, right? My life, my middle-class life, maybe even arguably upper middle-class life was only costing 40 or $50,000 a year at most. That gives me flexibility, right? Laura and I were both CPAs. We could earn 40 or $50,000 if we had to and still have a lot of flexibility to jump on things that might present themselves to us. But if we had bogged ourselves down with multiple fancy cars and big McMansions and all the other trappings of what people think make a successful middle or upper middle class life, we wouldn't have had the opportunity to become truly wealthy, right? Mm -hmm. That's the real kick of this 
is that we became wealthy because we didn't care about looking wealthy. Isn't that, isn't that staggering, Jonathan, when you think about it? It is. It is. And, it, and there's a pattern here. You'll, you, you'll see it over and over again. You know, and if we, if we look at Shane, this, this question for him, you know, Shane could be thinking to himself, well, I'm not, you know, I'm, I'm not a dual income family making, you know, $80,000 a year. And, and, I, and I wanted to point that out, that that is actually, you know, that's, that's an important distinction. But even married couples need to take a look at this and say, are we basing our life around a dual income that may not be here in a few years? Are we, are we building our structural expenses into our life that right now, yeah, it's only 25% of our take-home pay, but in four or five years might look like 60 or 70? you know, that you are setting yourself up for a very painful jerk back on your expenses. And you're, you're, it's just, it's something to keep in mind. Now, now with Shane though, even though maybe it's not a dual income situation, the numbers are actually more clear in terms of how much money you actually have. So if you're making, you know, $41,000 a year, cause Brad, I'm going back to your initial example here, $41,000 a year, you divide that by 12, assuming you were bringing 100% of that home, which you're not because taxes, but assuming you were bringing 100% of that home, your operating bandwidth on a month to basis is around $3,400. You have $3,400 to work with. If you, if, if you're striving for a 50% savings rate, you know, on that, on that income. So divide that by two. 1700, right, Brad? I did that real fast. Yeah, yeah. Very impressive. <laughs> All right. $1,700 is what you'd like to set aside, leaving you $1,700 uh, to, to live off of. If your mortgage and car combined cost 1500, you're toast. You can't do it. You got 200 left over for everything else. It's not going to, it's not, it's not going to be viable. So these structural expenses that you commit yourself to this early on in your journey will really dictate the flexibility you're going to have over the next several years. And for individuals, now, now we're talking specifically about Shane and we think about individuals that we've highlighted on the story that made slightly different choices and were able to get phenomenal results just looking at the problem a little differently. Someone like Shane will probably find it easier at this stage in life to maybe try something like, like house hacking. Brad, for Shane specifically, Share how a tactic like house hacking this early in his career could be the one thing that sets him on the path to fight. Just as an example, we could go in other places, but how would house hacking completely change the calculus on what I just laid out? Yeah. So Jonathan, house hacking is something that was originally presented to us, I guess, multiple times, right? So we've heard this from Chad Carson. I know uh, Scott Trench did something similar, right? Many, many people who've been on our show. It's, it's basically, it, it's a fancy way of saying you're buying a house and you're living with roommates and those roommates, whether they're friends of yours or just, you know, other roommates that you, that you get through Craigslist or whatever it may be, right? These people are paying for all of, or the vast majority of your mortgage. Okay. So another way of doing this, there's, there's never just one path. And I, I will go back to the house hacking here, but it could just be sharing an apartment or share renting a house and sharing it with four or five friends. You know, if a house costs fifteen hundred dollars a month to to rent, and there are four bedrooms plus a study, and five of you can live there, it's three hundred dollars a month, right? You again, you don't have to prove to everybody how mature and classy you are by living by yourself just because you're 23 and you have a job, right? Like the ultimate goal here is financial independence and freedom. So make the decisions that work best for your life. Don't try to impress people. I think that is probably like the piece of advice I would give myself and to give Shane is you don't have to worry about impressing people. You make the best decisions you can. And again, these structural expenses, they make a difference. So going back to house hacking, that clearly requires a little more effort than just renting a house or renting an apartment and sharing it. But it's the same concept, right? You're, you're buying, you're identifying a house that is going to work for, for this purpose. So find that four bedroom house where you can rent out the other three bedrooms and it covers all of your mortgage, most of your mortgage, or frankly, it could be more than your mortgage, right? Like there are people we know who are house hacking and are actually earning money. They're getting paid to live in their house. And that is really, really cool. So 
clearly you have to get to a point where you can purchase a house. You have to identify the right house. Uh, but those are, that's easy in the grand scheme of things, right? You can figure this out. There are programs that offer 3% down on, on FHA loans. I mean, you don't need to save 20% to get that first house. So the, the normal reflexive response is, oh, but I need to save for years to do this. Well, there are ways around this and, and we're not advising people being financially irresponsible. This is quite the contrary, right? This is, you're going in with a plan that if I can, I know what my mortgage payment is going to be monthly based on this small down payment. And again, if I can rent out the other bedrooms for an amount that covers that, then that is the perfect house hack. Yeah. And so it, it could be bedrooms. It could be, it could be units, you know, like sure. a duplex, triplex or a quad. So you're not even having people inside your house. Um, but if you make this one decision, you know, whereas everybody else is trying to fact, factor out, am I going to be able to get a place for $800 a month or 1500 or 3000, you know, they're just trying to figure out, you're just like, well, what if I could just live for free? You know, what if this $800 to $1,000 a month expense that everybody else says, well, that's just something that's going to take a big line item. What if I could just get that for free? Scott Trench dialed that up even farther. Now we should say, look at what Scott Trench has been able to achieve for himself, the opportunity he's been able to create by stacking a few of these strategies together. This is not about you living in a basement 10 or 20 years from now because you're still doing this. This is about what if you made one quote unquote hard choice that and it gave you decades of your life back, like just decades of options. So in Scott Trencher's place, he did exactly this. He's a college grad working for one of the, they were rated the num the worst company in the world. He won't tell us who that is. And I won't say it because I don't want them to hear it, but you can look it up. Look for that year. If you go to listen to the episode, look at that year, who was rated the worst company in the world to work for? He worked for him. And uh, what he did is like, I need to find better mentors. And that's how he kind of stumbled into the bigger pockets community, right? As Josh and Brandon were looking for some additional help. And he started hearing about this idea of house hacking. He said, what if I just did it? What if I went from just an idea to action? What if I just did it? And he said, what if I dialed it up even further? So I'll get a house hack based on the principles that we just laid out. And then on top of that, he said, what's the second piece of that pie chart that everybody's spending money on? Transportation, because you got to finance a car. Right now, the average car payment in America, $500. And guess who's the most susceptible to, to the I deserve it mindset? New college grads who finally have a paycheck that can finally get rid of the beater car and they get the new car. $500 a month plus a brand new house with a lot of payments you know, that's moving you up closer to 2000 for most people. But what if instead you said, I'm going to house hack rent for virtually free, you know, live for virtually free because my tenants are paying the mortgage. And then on top of that, what if I found a house hack close to my job, the job that I'm already making an above median salary doing now, do I really even, do I just bike to work? Do I create a lifestyle a la Mr. Money mustache around just biking? Now that is for most people, that's 40% of their expenses. 40% of their expenses, 30 to 40% of their expenses are just housing and transportation. And if you take care of just those two things, those two things, you've already baked in a 40% savings rate into your lifestyle. If you wanted to dial that up even further, you could, a la Brad Barrett here, you could go back to this idea of anchoring yourself to, Brad, I'll, I'll let you share the rule. Lay, lay the groundworks down for this rule. This is, this is the trifecta though, right? So I'll give this back to you, Brad Barrett, but this is the, uh, this is, this is the trifecta, the two dot, the anchoring yourself to $2 per person per meal, Brad, you know, if you add those three, you know, housing, transportation, and food that makes up probably over 50% on the vast majority of people's expenses. If you can anchor yourself to this, what did that do in your own life? Yeah. The food portion has been significant. So yeah, that is really the trifecta and, and that those three decisions, the cars, as I talked about the housing and the food, I would say that propelled myself and my wife on our path to FI almost entirely. And, and those three decisions, and we've never felt like we're depriving ourselves. So Laura absolutely loves to cook. It is basically her true passion in life. And she just loves exploring new meals, making delicious things. We're not looking to sacrifice in any way. So we're looking for healthy meals, we're looking for delicious meals and we're looking for things that she can make and potentially have leftovers. So she doesn't want to be in the kitchen all day, every day, as much as she enjoys this, she wants to cook two or three times. So it's just about, it's about long-term thinking. And I think that is another hallmark of Phi is we're not just thinking about instant gratification. We're trying to come up with a plan that's going to make our lives better. 
And I think while this is such a tiny little microcosm, obviously about food, I think this really does typify the kind of thinking. So every week, usually on Sunday, Laura sits down and comes up with a plan for the meals for the week. All right. She knows she needs to cook for the four of us for, for seven nights. And what does that look like in the most, the most efficient way, but not in like, I, I don't mean this in like this laborious, like, oh, I need to be an automaton and, and do it efficiently. It's she's trying to look at our lives that week. Hey, we're going to the pool on Friday night. So we need to bring food that can go there or, Hey, we've got something planned that night. So we definitely want leftovers for Wednesday evening that we can just heat up really quickly. It's just, it's looking at the reality of your life. So she'll generally speaking, come up with, let's say two or three meals that she's going to cook that make at least, at least leftovers for an entire other night. So if she's making three meals that she plans to cook, she, we're getting at least six nights of dinner worth out of those three meals. And almost invariably, there's some smorgasbord of leftovers that are available. And Jonathan, I love eating like the most random concoctions. So maybe this is a, a little bit only pertinent to me, but she always knows that even if it's some wacko set of leftovers, like I'll gladly eat them. She can pull a slice of pizza out of the freezer and there's our seventh night, right? That's the cool thing is you just look at the reality of the situation. And what she's noticed over these years is that these delicious home cooked meals come out to about, now this is plus or minus, but, but within reason, it's about $2 per person per meal or per serving, however you want to call it. So we are basically between the two of us, we're spending about $4. Then we usually have like a, a craft beer. That's like another dollar each or so. So, I mean, we're, for an entire dinner, that is fantastic, right? We have a happy hour with these craft beers. We have our, our lovely dinner. We've been eating outside so much more often. Like we make a thing of this. This is a highlight of our day. This is not just, Hey, let's eat rice and beans as inexpensively as we possibly can. No, this is, this truly is the highlight of our day. So $2 per person per meal. I mean that if you tried to compare that to what you're spending when you go out to eat, even for something kind of fast casual or, Oh, I'm just going to go to the grocery store and get the, the hot bar, right. For $12 a pound. It's, it's a fraction. It's a tiny, tiny little fraction. So, I mean, Jonathan, the ultimate answer to your question, like we are probably saving a thousand dollars a month really, really easily on our food budget as compared to basically all the other people that we know as you know, when you add up the going out to eat and the food budget in the house, when you sum those two and you look at ours, I guarantee you it's a thousand dollars less per month. All right. So we're going to take all these and I want to point out to Shane that like, it's not, we're, we're giving you kind of maybe sometimes extreme examples in the case of house hacking, very plausible. I would do this. I'm just telling you if I were 23 years old again, not married, no kids. I mean, there's people that married that do this as well, but I'm just saying I would 1000% look into this if I were exactly in this point, graduating, starting to build my new life. Uh, I would be looking for an opportunity like that with the confidence that by the age of 30, I'd probably be at the point where working is optional, even on maybe even a below $50,000 a year salary, just by making this one choice. That, that's how powerful it is. But I have a house. Brett has a house. It's not, it's not binary. You still just need to look at the math. If you get a $2,000 a month mortgage payment, you're really cutting into your ability to have options with over the next few years, unless you dramatically increase your income. So something along the lines of, you know, 25% of your take home pay is kind of like maybe a rough target. You know, I wouldn't go above that. So if you're making $3,000 a month, I mean, we're going to try to sub $1,000, sub $1,000 for what you're spending on your house. It's just, we're trying to get to a 50% savings rate or at least approach it 30%. If 50% is going to housing, you still got to take care of transportation. You still got to take care of food. Like, we got, we got to be mindful of the math here. So just look at house hacking for some resources there. Uh, I was tracking down a couple episodes for you. Uh, episode 16 with Chad Carson, we talked about house hacking and then episode 148R with Craig Kirlop. He has a new book out. If that's interesting to you, check that out. 148R with all of these, you can do like choosefi.com slash and then the three digit number. So in the house and number 16 would be choosefi.com slash 016. And then 148R would be choosefi.com slash 148R. Uh, and that will take you to those episodes. 
Uh, the next one was car ownership. Right now, you are, you know, the advertiser's dreams. New college grad is the primary market for that new car. You deserve it. Just think through that. This isn't about necessarily going with no car. But in episode 22 of our podcast, uh, we took a really hard look at the cost of car ownership. You should think through that before committing to a car. And then we could pair that with some strategies like, you know, this could be trying to convince you to get a gently used car and drive it forever or get a new car and drive it forever. But the, the idea is you, none of us can afford to be managing the car payments for our entire investing life. That is not going to lead to a good outcome. Um, so once we tie both of those together, if you're like, well, what does $2 per person per meal look like? We have created a really great resource on our website for that. Just go to chooseofi.com slash meals. You're making $40,000 a year. Now as a new grad, hopefully that is going to come with raises year over year, uh, whether it stays in the same industry or you end up piv pivoting to other industry. Either way, you're going to benefit from this idea of career hacking and salary negotiation. So I would recommend you listen. Actually, it's an episode. It's way back in the archives, but it's really good. Episode 23 of our podcast with ESI called career hacking really talks about how to make sure when you go into your, uh, into your, you know, annual performance reviews, you're crushing it. And then Brad mentioned Jessica and Tori Dunlap. I know with Jessica, I think that I wrote that down. That's episode 211. If you want to follow up on how to negotiate your salary without burning bridges. And then we didn't get to this in this question, but I'm just saying, these are the tactics that you stack together. The other part was investing tips. Our, our entire strategy is that there aren't tips. There's just simplicity. Let's avoid tips. Let's avoid hot tips. Like, is Nikola good this week or bad this week? Is Tesla hot this week or bad this week? I, who knows? Like, don't, that's noise. And what we want is like a consistent, predictable outcome. We just want to try to keep up with the market. We'll focus on everything else. We'll focus on earning the income. We'll focus on outperforming. We can focus on entrepreneurship and spending less. Let's focus, spend our time figuring out how to increase that savings rate, right? By working on the equation. For the investing for right now, as we're getting our best line, Let's try to follow the simple path. So I saved the best for last. I want you to listen to episode 19 of our podcast with JL Collins, The Simple Path to Wealth. That's actually part one of a three-part series, but start there. And here's like our point. We use this avatar. And Shane, thank you so much for allowing us to kind of use your story to kind of give some of this advice, but also showcase to the audience. There's four years of content here. And each week we're going to try and bring you a new idea. And I think there's value to just binge listening to the archives. But as we go forward, our goal is when you get on this back to basics list, we're going to try and on-ramp you onto the content that will serve you. So over the next two months, the team is working proactively to figure out, you tell us where you are on this path and we will tee up for you the content over the last four years that will best serve you on this stage that you're at. And then we'll readdress because we're all working towards something. We're not staying static. We're not staying in the same place. We're working towards this goal of financial independence. So once Shane has all of this locked down, Maybe he's looking for the next piece. So hopefully by next year, we're ready to serve that up and keep moving this thing forward. So that's just kind of my framework for this. This is not about hitting a number. It's not about a certain net worth. It's about optimizing your life, but having good information, trusted information to do that. Yeah, so this is just, this is a life optimization strategy. I mean, and this, Brad, this is why I get so excited about coming back to this conversation every single week, because yes, the information doesn't necessarily change, but it needs to be shared. It needs to be shared with as many people as possible. Yeah, you're absolutely right. And, and thanks for obviously pulling up all of those, those old episodes. They're, they're so pertinent. And really, if, that's, if this is information you're looking for, like Shane, right? Shane asked about wanting to learn more about investing in the stock market, which is wonderful. I knew absolutely nothing about investing in the stock market. I always thought it was something you needed Again, it's that insider information. And like you said, JL Collins was on our show in episode 19. He has the famous stock series at his website, jlcollinsnh.com. That to me changed my entire life. And it made me finally have some, some mental security with investing in the stock market. And it was something that I realized, wow, I can do this. I understand again, this is long-term thinking. It's not short-term, how can I get that tip? How can I win? How can I get lucky ultimately? It's how can I establish wealth over a 50 to 70 year investing timeline, right? That was what I was looking at. And what is the highest likelihood? What is gonna increase the odds of me being successful over that investing timeline? And what I've hit on personally is low cost index fund investing. And that is what JL Collins 
introduced to me and to literally millions of other people. And that's what I would advise Shane to at least start his path towards this knowledge. You can always layer on. We have people like Brian Feraldi, who's been on multiple, multiple times on the show. And he talks about individual stock investing and he does it extremely intelligently. And he also says that this is not the only way to invest or even the only way he invests. He still is a big believer in index funds, but he believes that individual stock investing is right for him for a certain percentage of his overall portfolio. And that's wonderful because he's done the research and he believes that is going to work for him. That is his choice. But I think the absolute starting place is learn about this simple path to wealth and then move forward as you see fit. So Shane, that, that would be my advice on, on the second half of your question. And I think, I think we gave a pretty good overview here of how do you approach a FI life? And now for all the listeners out there who are saying, oh, I'm not 23. How does this apply to me? I think Jonathan, all of this stuff applies to everybody. It's, it's, it's a way of thinking, right? It's a way of setting up a framework of a life that doesn't cost that much. And even frankly, if you've already made decisions that you ideally want to unwind or that you wish you could have taken back, well, join the club, honestly, right? I, I've made terrible, terrible decisions with investments that were actually speculation on, I don't know. I mean, it was ridiculous. Like I've talked about this, how many hundreds of thousands of dollars I probably lost compounded on, on this land investing that I did in my twenties. Like I've made mistakes, calamitous mistakes, and I still reach financial independence. You just have to get better and just make these small little choices to, to get better, to learn more and to reach financial independence on your timeline. And I think this is intensely personal. So again, this is not about me and Jonathan or anybody dictating to you what your life is supposed to look like, how you're supposed to live it. It's none of that. It's providing this framework of information and then you take it, you learn what's applicable to you and you move forward, but you have to take action. Nothing gets better if you're just listening or reading passively. You have to get up off the couch and take action. And I mean, that, that to me is, is so hopeful, right? Like we can all get better. We've all made mistakes. We've all done stupid things, but we can all get better just by learning and then acting on it. All right, to our audience, I hope this is encouraging. I think all of us could benefit from going back to basics. And let me just challenge you on this. If you've been listening periodically to some Choose Fi episodes and you're getting value, but what's holding you back from really getting started is you just need a plan that serves you where you are. Let me encourage you, just go ahead, get started. Go to chooseify.com slash start. Get on our email list. And specifically, as soon as you get on the email list, we're gonna send you a welcome email that's gonna contain our essential listing with some of the episodes. If you were just frantically scrambling to write down some notes about what episodes I just mentioned, I'm gonna to put together 20 episodes that I think will have value for you, regardless of where you are on your journey. You're gonna get that on the welcome email plus five suggestions to go deeper into the community. And then from there, you will just get a once a week email from Brad letting you know just kind of what's going on and where this community is headed, what's going on inside the community. But uh, get started, right? This is ideas are a dime a dozen. Action is everything. Go to chooseify.com slash start. Let's get back to basics together. The fire is spreading, my friends. We'll see you next time as we continue to go down the road less traveled. <laughs> 